Hello everybody, I would say good morning, but it's actually the very early afternoon and this video is a bit late today. But you know what? It's Sunday, so I have made a little cappuccino. Oh yeah, you know I love those. And you know what? We have this theme of this daily language diary video. We talked about how important it is to say yes to language learning every day, to show up every day, and so I'm showing up today even if it's a little bit behind schedule. Also, this is day 21 of the Daily Language Diary series. Three weeks of daily videos, amazing topics, fantastic questions, and more amazing comments than I could possibly count. So just like cheers to all of you. It really feels like we are all on this journey together and it's just been absolutely fantastic. So here's to you, here's to language learning and another week after this of just epic daily videos. That's so good, it almost hurts. All right, so I'm really excited about today's daily question because it comes from El Nish. I'm not sure if you pronounce it El Nish, your username, but El Nish has been another amazing commenter. So many good comments and it's really funny because I believe you're located like just across the water over in San Francisco, which is pretty cool. So El Nish says, you've really been on fire with this language diary series. Oh, absolutely. 21 days. Quick question. As a polyglot, is there anything about your own particular language learning method that may differ from other polyglots? Or do you all share the same common method of learning? Cheers. Oh, another amazing question. So for those of you who don't know, I've been pretty involved in the sort of polyglot community since about 2014. That's when I produced my first documentary on this channel. And since then, I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of extremely impressive and effective polyglots from all over the world. A few examples are Richard Simcott. He's an absolutely spectacular guy. And we multiple times spent the day together uh, once in England, where we're both from, once in Lisbon, Portugal, where I was living at the time. Also on this channel, I made a series called Living the Language with the spectacular Luca Lampariello, where we went to Lyon, France, and we did a whole little series together in French. I've had the pleasure of collaborating with Steve Kaufman. I went to the Polyglot Conference in Serbia. I was very close friends at one point with Lydia Machova. So there's just so many wonderful and just frankly, spectacular language learners that I have had the pleasure of spending time with over all these years. And one thing I can tell you about all of those people, and I think effective polyglots in general, is that typically all of us arrive at a point where we have a sort of selection of different methods and ways that we learn languages. And each person will tend to have at least their own flavor of how they do a particular activity. Or in many cases, we actually end up developing our own unique methods or certainly things that are very tailored to our particular style of learning. Some examples from the list I just gave Luca Lampariello is pretty famous for his sort of bi-directional translation method that he has certainly made his own over the years. Steve Kaufman certainly has a input first approach where he will tend to do tons and tons of reading and listening for a very long time before he begins speaking. On the complete opposite side of the spectrum, you have people like Benny Lewis who believe in speaking from day one. And then there are other contrasts, like for example, many polyglots will tend to shy away from classes and not find them to be particularly helpful or inspiring. Inspiring. But Richard Simcott has learned a lot of languages over the years by taking classes. He studied a ton of languages in university and he frequently takes online courses to this day. And so he tends to really enjoy language classes. So needless to say, there is certainly a large amount of differences between different successful or effective polyglots and the ways that we learn languages. But there are also lots of commonalities between us. Now, some of these are a bit less specific. So you'll find that most really effective polyglots have certainly made choices to make learning languages a lifestyle. And by the way, the funny thing is that that lifestyle also looks very different from person to person. But I think that people on the list I just gave amongst many others, we strive to learn languages to very high levels and try to maintain those levels over time. And so at a certain point, if you're gonna maintain that many languages, and especially if you're gonna continue to learn new ones, then I think that learning languages has to, at a certain point, just become a part of your lifestyle. Now, another really important thing to mention though is that while we do have these sort of common traits and common things that most of us do. Even then you'll find that there are sort of anomalies or outliers. And I can actually use myself as an example here. So I do have a lot of sort of 
systems that I have either created myself or designed myself, or at least my own flavors of doing certain activities that are fairly unique or tailored to my style of learning. There are also certain things that I do that are literally opposite to what many polyglots will recommend. So I mentioned this in a recent video, but I think that by and large, there's a fairly accepted idea that lots of effective polyglots tend to favor sort of extensive input approaches versus intensive input approaches. So for example, extensive reading is when you really rely more on reading lots of content and you get a high volume of content that you go through. You don't usually use a dictionary. The whole idea is that instead of stopping for every word and trying to figure out the meaning of everything, you kind of just read through things and you rely a lot more on sheer volume. And the idea there is that if you focus on reading a lot of content, you're bound to see a lot of repetition. So you're gonna see the same words popping up over and over again. And over time, you will be able to sort of infer meaning because you've seen the same words pop up over and over in different contexts. And this kind of allows you to correlate meaning. Now there's a lot more I could say about the extensive reading approach, but just to sort of contrast that with the intensive approach, in that case, you're probably going to have a dictionary or various tools and resources next to you. And the goal of reading and studying that material is to really extract all the meaning. So you're going to be taking notes, you're going to be writing down words you didn't know, you're going to be looking things up. And generally speaking, there's an argument that the first approach is a lot more effective and that you're going to be able to cover so much more content that way. And you're going to be learning so many things, not just through context, but again, through sort of correlating and extrapolating meaning from real context, but lots of variety as well. And I think the idea is that if you start looking up every single word and you focus too much on wanting to understand everything, then it slows you down a lot and you sort of lose momentum and you're not able to get that same rich sort of variety and depth of context as you would if you do the extensive approach. There's also a broad discussion on Stephen Krashen's idea of comprehensible input. And a lot of people interpret this to mean that if you don't understand 91 or 92, I've even heard 93% of content when you first read it on a page, then it's too difficult because it's not comprehensible. And so a lot of people take this idea that you should find content that you can understand 92% and then you should do extensive reading and this is how you'll get the most bang for your buck. Now again, I'm just talking about this in very broad strokes. There are more details to discuss, but that's the kind of overview of a lot of what ends up being recommended. Whereas personally for me, I do not follow that approach at all. I'm kind of the opposite. So if we stick with this example of reading, I am basically the opposite. For me, I like to think of myself as a detective, as a scavenger, sort of desperately trying to find meaning in a piece of text. For me, it is exhilarating to look at this piece of text and to think there's so much mystery, there's so much meaning in inside of here that I don't yet understand, but it's all right there. The words are on the page. And so I love just like diving into a piece of text. I love extracting every ounce of meaning that I can. And there's also a story inside of those pages. There is a story to be told that I am not yet able to understand. And so for me, this journey of uncovering that story, of discovering all the meaning, of learning about all the characters, and sort of finally being able to say, I understood this chapter or this book. The relationship that I develop with the characters, the relationship I develop with the narrative and the overall story is so strong because it took me so much effort and time and thought to figure out all the missing pieces, all of the gaps, and to just grasp simply the meaning. So like I said, I find that whole process to be so exhilarating and it's so powerful for learning a language. But most importantly of all, I love doing that. And so it doesn't matter that a lot of people recommend the opposite approach. And to be honest, even if we could say that perhaps objectively speaking, maybe the extensive approach is a bit more effective, that doesn't matter because I enjoy doing it so much and it fits my personality and the way that I like to learn so perfectly that I can be just as effective as anybody else when I use those methods. And also I should say that these different methods tend to have different benefits and also different disadvantages. So there are some 
people who have a far less detailed approach, but they definitely focus on getting lots of volume and lots of mass exposure. And some of those people may become incredibly effective communicators, but they may not be terribly accurate, for example. Whereas because my approach is so heavily detailed and has so many layers, and I focus so much on taking all kinds of copious notes, and I just, I try to extract every ounce of value I can from every piece of content. Well, the result of this is that the languages that I learn to speak well, I tend to do so with very high accuracy. I tend to speak very idiomatically. I tend to learn a lot of phrases and natural idioms, natural ways of saying things. And I think that's a particular benefit and trait that comes from the way that I choose to learn languages. But again, there are people who use the more extensive approach and that still manage to gain a similar level of accuracy when they learn a language. So I know I gave you a lot of examples there, and I know this was definitely a pretty high level overview of different ways that different polyglots might learn languages. But I hope that helps to sort of express that I think that effective polyglots always tend to over time develop their own flavors and ways of doing things that really work well for them. And that's actually what makes us so effective at learning languages is that we just over time figure out exactly what works for us, exactly how we like to learn. And to be honest, that's one of my favorite things about doing these videos and all the content that I create. It's such a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to share all the different things that I do, the different things that I find to be fun and effective and just, oh my God, I just, I love sharing the passion that I have for learning languages the way that I do. But it's also an amazing opportunity to explore ways that other people learn languages. And I love the fact that there are more and more people making this type of content so that all of you get to see so many different ways of learning languages successfully. Okay, El Nish, I hope that was helpful. I hope that was a nice response to your question. Again, I'm sorry that today's video is a little bit later than usual, but you know what? I said yes, I showed up. And so happy Sunday afternoon, and I wish all of you a great rest of the day, and I'll see you back here tomorrow for another fourth week of Daily Language Diary videos.